It's a great pleasure to be in Cambridge, scene of four years of my misspent youth. Uh, when I lived more or less right around the corner from here for the first two years on the Appian Way, and then I lived kind of down the street on Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, and I kind of like to set disaster novels more or less here. So if you walk the walk of The Handmaid's Tale, you can pretty much identify all of the buildings in it. You'll be happy to know that the Brattle Theater is where they go to get their costumes, and that Widener Library is where the Secret Service will be hanging out in that particular future. Whereas in Oryx and Craig, you can see some, some of the more fervent members of the God's Gardeners uh, tossing coffee into the harbor at the Boston Coffee Party. Uh, <laughs> and this area is particularly available for the future of Oryx and Crate because it's, it's sort of flat, so that when the sea rises, everything is going to move inland, uh, as it has done in, in the, futures, uh, the future of these two books. The Year of the Flood is not a um, sequel, and it's not a prequel. It is what I call a simultaneal. It takes place at, at the same time as Oryx and Crake, but in a different part of the landscape. In the Victorian novel, there's a chapter called Meanwhile, quite frequently. You know that when you're reading the Meanwhile chapter, that what you're reading is taking place uh, at the same time, but in a different location from what you just read in the chapter before, and that sooner or later, the people in the Meanwhile chapter will meet up with the people in the chapter before, as they never fail to do. And so it is with Year of the Flood and, and Oryx and Crake. Oryx and Crake is told from within the elite of the future, and the Year of the Flood is told from the exact opposite. The people in it are living in a, a public space that has been abandoned by the meld of corporations and, and government that's, that we just saw move a bit nearer. <laughs> With all that money going into banks and auto companies, oh, oh. Um, so where these people live is, is not protected in any way. There are indeed two, two female voices, Toby and Wren. Toby, an older person who has been rescued by the gardeners, a green religious group growing vegetables on flat rooftops, raising bees up there. Y you sort of can't write anything without it then either taking place or without you discovering that it's already happening. And there is, in fact, an urban beekeeping movement now in which people are growing bees on rooftops. And there is also a veering towards greenness in religious communities already. It's already happening. So Toby gets rescued by them. Wren, on the other hand, ends up there because her mother has run off with one of them. And both of them are somewhat reluctant members of this community. But when the novel opens, the global pandemic called the waterless flood, long foreseen by the gardeners, has swept through and our two characters have survived it. One of them because she's been locked up in the quarantine zone of a high-end sex club called Scales and Tails, where she has been working as a trapeze dancer, that would be Rand, and the other one because she has locked herself into the A New You Spa, where she has been working as the manager. I think a spa would be a good place in which to survive a pandemic. So there's lots of towels. Facial products are edible. And in fact, we already have edible facial pro products. I, I, I asked, you can get lemon meringue facial that you can eat. Now, <laughs> there's also a kind made with chocolate. I forget what that's supposed to do for you, but, but they've got it. Uh, what I'm going to do is just describe the gardeners 
a bit to you and then play you some of their music because they are a, a fully fledged religion. They have their own theology, they have their leader, his name is Adam One, and they have their own hymns. And the hymns are an integral part of the text. Uh, they Each section begins with a little piece of theology by Adam One, and then it's followed by a hymn. And I did not originally intend to have music for these hymns, although I imagined them set to hymns that already exist. You can do a pretty good uh, mole day song to the tune of God Sees the Little Sparrow Fall, and so forth. But the partner of my agent, who is a musician and composer, got into the text when it was still just in manuscript, and he started channeling these people. <laughs> in fact, I think he thought he kind of became them and started composing their music. And he sent me some of the first ones he did, so I said, just keep going as long as you feel like it. And he kept going through all 14 of the God's Gardener hymns. And then he put them on a CD. And then we put them on a website at www.yearoftheflood.com. And then we incorporated them into some of the fully fledged dog and pony uh, three actors singing group musical events that we have been doing to basically save the albatross. So that's how they got music. And I'm going to start by playing you three of the God's Gardener's hymns as composed by Orville. They are uh, rather peppy ones. Not all of them are quite this peppy. But <laughs> they are for the following uh, gardener's days. Um, they're for, uh, I think it's Creation Day, for the Festival of Arcs, and for St. Ewell of Wild Foods. That would be Ewell Gibbons. There are some other saints in this book that will be well known to you. You'll be happy to know that in the future, Al Gore will be a saint. He's already beaming with beams of saintliness, we feel. And E.O. Wilson is indeed a saint. He is Saint E.O. Wilson of Hymenoptera. He may not know this yet, but he's going to know it tomorrow because I just gave him a book with the pages marked. The Mole Day hymn is particularly appropriate for him. Uh, so after the hymns, I will read a sample from each of the three voices, concluding with Adam One, who will I'll give you the, a bit of the Mole Day speech, and then I personally will sing you the Mole Day hymn, which is the only one I can sing. It is a children's hymn and kind of simple. So, so that's the program. And now we're going to hear the first three hymns. So that's a little sample of the gardeners and their music. And now we're going to join Toby in year 25. It's St. Bashir Alus Day. You may never heard of him. He is actually quite a saintly person because he was the inspiration for the the Iraqi bird book developed under fire, but it's out now. Toby, she's in the Anuyu Spa. She takes her baths in the early morning before the sun's too hot. She keeps a number of pails and bowls up on the rooftop for collecting the afternoon storm rainwater. The spa has its own well, but the solar system's broken, so the pumps are useless. She does the laundry on the rooftop, too, spreading it out on the benches to dry. She uses the gray water to flush her toilet. She rubs herself with soap. There's still a lot of soap, all of it pink, and sponges off. My body is shrinking, she thinks. I'm puckering. I'm dwindling. Soon I'll be nothing but a hangnail though she's always been on the skinny side. Oh, to Biotha, the ladies used to say, if only I had your figure. She dries herself off, slips on a pink smock. This one says, Melody. There's no need to label herself now that nobody's left to read the labels, so she's begun wearing the smocks of the others, 
Anita Quintana Wren Carmel Symphony. Those girls had been so cheerful, so hopeful. Not Wren, though. Wren had been sad, but Wren had left earlier. Then all of them had left once the trouble hit. They'd gone home to be with their families, believing love could save them. You go ahead, I'll lock up, Toby had told them. And she had locked up, but with herself inside. She scrubs her long, dark hair, twists it into a wet bun. She really must cut it. It's thick and too hot. As she's drying her hair, she hears an odd sound. She goes cautiously to the rooftop railing. Three huge pigs are nosing around the swimming pool, two sows and a boar. The morning light shines on their plump, pinky-gray forms. They glisten like wrestlers. They seem too large and bulbous to be normal. She spotted pigs like this before in the meadow, but they've never come this close. Escapees, they must be, from some experimental farm or other. Toby follows the railing, tracking them. They've found the garden fence. They're looking in. Then one of them begins to dig. They'll tunnel under. Get away from there, Toby shouts at them. They peer up at her, dismiss her. She scrambles down the stairs as fast as she can without slipping. Idiot. She should keep the rifle with her at all times. She grabs it from her bedside, hurries back up to the roof. She holds one of the pigs in the scope, a boar, an easy shot, he sideways, but then she hesitates. They're God's creatures, never kill, without just cause, said Adam One. I'm warning you, she yells. Amazingly, they seem to understand her. They must have seen a weapon before. They squeal in alarm, then turn and run. They're a quarter of the way across the meadow when it occurs to her, they'll be back. They'll dig under at night and root up her garden in no time flat, and that will be the end of her long-term food supply. She'll have to shoot them. It's self-defense. She squeezes off her round, misses, tries again. The boar falls down. The two sows keep running. Only when they've reached the forest rim do they turn and look back. Then they meld with the foliage and are gone. Toby's hands are shaking. You've snuffed a life, she tells herself. You've acted rashly and from anger. You ought to feel guilty. Still, she thinks of going out with one of the kitchen knives and sewing off a ham. She'd taken the veggie vows when she joined the gardeners, but the prospect of a bacon sandwich is a great temptation right now. She resists it, however. Animal protein should be the last resort. She murmurs the standard gardener words of apology, though she doesn't feel apologetic or not apologetic enough. Wren, remembering her childhood. I lived with Lucerne and Zeb in a building about five blocks from the garden. It was called the Cheese Factory because that's what it used to be, and it still had a faint cheesy smell to it. After the cheese, it was used for artists' lofts, but there weren't any artists left, and nobody seemed to know who owned it. Meanwhile, the gardeners had taken it over. They liked living in places where they didn't have to pay rent. Our space was a big room with some cubicles curtained off, one for me, one for Lucerne and Zeb, one for the Violet Violet, one for the shower. The cubicle curtains were woven of plastic bag strips and duct tape, and they weren't in any way soundproof. This wasn't great, especially when it came to the violet violet. The gardener said digestion was holy and there was nothing funny or terrible about the smells and noises that were part of the end product of the nutritional process, but at our place, those end products were hard to ignore. We ate our meals in the main room on a table made out of a door. All of our dishes and pots and pans were salvaged, gleaned, as the gardener said, except for some of the thicker plates and mugs. 
Those had been made by the gardeners back in their ceramics period before they decided that kilns used up too much energy. I slept on a futon stuffed with husks and straw. It had a quilt sewed out of blue jeans and used bath mats. And every morning I had to make the bed first thing because the gardeners liked neatly made beds, though they weren't squeamish about what they were made of. Then I'd take my clothes down from the nail on the wall and put them on. I got clean ones every seventh day. The gardeners didn't believe in wasting water and soap on too much washing. My clothes were always dank because of the humidity and because the gardeners didn't believe in dryers. God made the sun for a reason, Nuala used to say, and according to her, that reason was for drying our clothes. Luzerne would still be in bed at being her favorite place. Back when we lived at Healthweiser with my real father, she'd hardly ever stayed inside our house, but here she almost never went out of it except to go over to the rooftop or the wellness clinic and help the other gardener women peel burdock roots or make those lumpy quilts or weave those plastic bag curtains or something. Zeb would be in the shower. No daily showers was one of the many gardener rules Zeb ignored. Our shower water came down a garden hose out of a rain barrel, so no energy was used. That was Zeb's reason for making an exception for himself. He'd be singing. Nobody gives a hoot, nobody gives a hoot, and that is why we're down the chute, because nobody gives a hoot. All his shower songs were negative in this way, though he sang them cheerfully in his big Russian bear voice. I had mixed feelings about Zeb. He could be frightening, but also it was reassuring to have someone so important in my family. Zeb was an Adam, a leading Adam. You could tell by the way the others looked up to him. He was large and solid with a biker's beard and long hair, brown with a little gray in it, and a leathery face and eyebrows like a barbed wire fence. He looked as if he ought to have a silver tooth and a tattoo, but he didn't. He was strong as a bouncer, and he had the same menacing but genial expression as if he'd break your neck if necessary but not for fun. Sometimes he'd play dominoes with me. The gardeners were skimpy on toys. Nature is our playground. And the only toys they approved of were sewed out of leftover fabric or knitted with saved up string, or they'd be wrinkly old person figures with heads fashioned from dried crab apples. But they allowed dominoes because they carved the sets themselves. When I won, Zeb would laugh and say, at a girl, and then I'd get a warm feeling like nasturtiums. Lucerne was always telling me to be nice to him because although he wasn't my real father, he was like my real father, and it hurt his feelings if I was rude to him. But then she didn't like it much when Zeb was nice to me, so it was hard to know how to act. The third voice is the voice of Adam One. It is Mole Day, year 12, of the life underground spoken by Adam One. Dear friends, dear fellow mammals, dear fellow creatures, I point no fingers, for I know not where to point, but as we have just seen, malicious rumors can spread confusion a careless remark can be as the cigarette butt casually tossed into the dumpster, smoldering until it bursts into flame and engulfs a neighborhood. Do guard your words in future. It is inevitable that certain friendships may lend themselves to undue comment, but we are not chimpanzees. Our females do not bite rival females. Our males do not jump up and down on our females and hit them with branches or not as a rule. All pair bondings are subject to stress and temptation, but let us not add to that stress nor misinterpret that temptation. Today we celebrate Mole Day, our festival of underground life. Mole Day is a children's festival, and our children have been busily at work decorating our Eden Cliff rooftop garden. 
The moles with their little claws fashioned from hair combs. The nematodes fashioned from transparent plastic bags. The earthworms of stuffed pantyhose and string. The dung beetles, what a testimony to our God-given powers of creativity through which even the useless and discarded may be redeemed from meaninglessness. We are inclined to overlook the very small that dwell among us, yet without them we ourselves could not exist, for every one of us is a garden of sub-visual life forms. Where would we be without the flora that populate the intestinal tract or the bacteria that defend against hostile invaders? We teem with multitudes, my friends, with the myriad forms of life that creep about under our feet and, I may add, under our toenails. True, we are sometimes infested with nanobioforms and we would prefer to be without, such as the eyebrow mite, the hookworm, the pubic louse, the pinworm, and the tick, not to mention the hostile bacteria and viruses. But think of them as God's tiniest angels, <laughs> doing his unfathomable work in their own way. For these creatures, too, reside in the eternal mind and shine in the eternal light and form a part of the polyphonic symphony of creation. Consider also his workers in the earth. Without the earthworms and nematodes and ants and their endless tilling of the soil, without which it would harden into a cement-like mass, extinguishing all life. Think of the antibiotic properties of the maggots and of the various molds, and of the honey that our bees make, and also of the spider's web, so useful in the stopping of blood flow from a wound. For every ill, God has provided a remedy in his great medicine cabinet of nature. When next you hold a handful of moist compost, say a silent prayer of thanks to all of Earth's previous creatures. Picture your fingers giving each and every one of them a loving squeeze, for they are surely here with us, ever present in that nourishing matrix. Now let us join our Buds and Blooms choir in singing our traditional Mole Day children's hymn. We praise the tiny perfect moles that garden underground, the ant, the worm, the nematode, wherever they are found. They live their whole lives in the dark, unseen by human sight. The earth is like the air to them, their day is like our night. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> they turn the soil and till it, they make the plants to thrive. The earth would be a desert if they were not alive. The little carrion beetles that seek unlikely places return our husks to e elements and tidy up our spaces. And so for God's small creatures beneath the field and wood, let us today give joyful thanks for God has found them good. Let us today give joyful thanks, for God has found them good. Well, then there's Toby, who actually doesn't want to be like any of them. <laughs> so some people are, from that point of view, you can write them and other people. You know, the interesting thing about heroes is that you usually get their story told by another person because if they told it themselves, you wouldn't be able to stand them. They'd be so puffed up with bad vanity about how heroic they are. And as a child, I always preferred Batman to Superman because I thought Superman was cheating, you know? <laughs> he had superpowers. He was from another planet, and, and Batman was, was just an ordinary person who put on this silly suit and uh, went out at night. And um, you could be actually, if you shot at him and hit him, the bullet would go in. So I, I thought that was more fair, as in, in a way. 
So maybe it came from that, that I, I never was that impressed with Superman as a child. I did really like Plastic Man quite a lot. Do you remember? You probably don't know who he was. Well, he had fallen into a vat of chemicals, their usual excuse, and it had made him very stretchy, <laughs> very stretchy. And he could sort of go under your door like a piece of chewing gum, and you could always tell what he had turned himself into, because he could turn himself into other shapes, like lamps or ashtrays, back when there were ashtrays, and, uh, <laughs> you know, a doorknob. But you could always tell it was him because the colors were the same. He was always some blue, some red, and some black, because he wore sunglasses. So he was my favorite, I have to admit, of all of them. How did he capture the villains? He wrapped himself around them like a big rubber band. That was his way of capturing villains. So it wasn't so much the Socko Pow as the surprise. <laughs> when Spider-Man came along, I quite liked him, but I was a bit too old by that time. He had psychological problems and a girlfriend, and the others never had those. So I'm the horror of... Uh question askers. You're the horror of question because askers. I have three do questions. your worst. <laughs> because I have three questions, all right. but are, they're all linked. So do you actually really have a dystopic view of the future? Number one, and, yes. And if you look at this, look at how mankind or humankind has evolved, you actually sort of get a sense that at least materially, we are better off now than our than thousand years okay, ago, that's for two. sure. That's two. So why would you have a dystopian yes. view if you have yes. one? And then finally, if this is there is going to be disaster, do you think it's going to be because of technology and something that people have done, or is it going to be psychological? That's something? three. Okay, got it. That's okay. Fine. Number one, dystopic view of the future. This is a very very optimistic book. Guess why? It's a book. <laughs> it's in there. Keep it in there. It's up to you. Number two, uh, don't you think that we are better off now than we were in the past? My question to you is, who is we? It's certainly not the one billion people on the earth right now that are entering a state of famine. Uh, so when we say we, we pretty much have to define who we are. Do we mean we in this building? Yes, we are doing pretty well here. It's very nice. It's not raining. Um, you all had dinner, or you will have it, that's really good. Uh, but that's a very small we. The uh, world in general is not quite that well off, and what people are really worrying about, people who do that kind of thinking all the time, what they're worrying about is the food supply. Because we, as a whole, um, are running out of arable land. We're certainly running out of fish in the ocean, which is why in Oryx and Craig, Jimmy has fish, fish fingers, 20% real fish, and you wonder what the other 80% is made of. Um, so, so sure, we in this room are better off. The world is not. And it's certainly in a, it's, it's in a much, um, it's in a much more falling apart state than it was even 100 years ago. Let me present you with this small little puzzle. See if you can guess the answer. You have a test tube. It's full of amoeba food. And into it, you put one amoeba. And that amoeba, amoeba divides in half every minute. You put the amoeba in at 12 o'clock noon. We know that at 12 o'clock midnight, the test tube is entirely full of amoebas, and there's no more amoeba food left. The question I have for you is, at what point is the test tube half full of amoebas and half full of amoeba food? You know the answer. It's one minute to midnight. A lot of people say six o'clock because it's halfway between. Uh, but it is, in fact, at one, one minute to midnight, things are looking pretty good for the amoebas. They still have a whole half a test tube left. One minute later, that's it. Uh, now, your third question was... Is the, so is the dystopia going to be because Oh, yeah. Is the dystopia going to be caused by technology or by something else? Um, first of all, it's a book. <laughs> <laughs> 
nobody can really predict the future because there are too many variables. And one of those variables is the human race, which is now driving quite a lot about itself. And we do not know how it is going to change its behavior. We don't know that yet. Uh, we do see as we go hither and thither about the planet that people do realize they have a problem. And therefore they're thinking very hard about that problem because we are a very creative uh, species and we are problem solvers and a lot of people are getting the point. So is our behavior going to change fast enough to keep this future in the book? Let's hope. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that we have just opened the biggest toy box uh, on the planet and probably in history and that is the DNA code. And because of that we can mix and match just like Mr. Potato Head. Uh, we can switch things around and we're busily at work doing that right now. So will we use our creative powers to play the, with this toy box in a helpful, useful, and optimistic way, or will we instead use it to do something which we can do, which is to make unfortunate diseases to which nobody has any immunity? And let me remind you that the mortality rate shortly after Columbus set foot uh, in the New World was, in most places, 100%. And in the period of the Black Death, it was 50%. So the biggest killer in human history has always been diseases to which people didn't have immunity. And we can make those uh, by combining our technology with natural forms that already exist. So the answer to your question is, worst case scenario, both. <laughs> Lock yourself up in that spa. <laughs> Edible facial products, your hope. Uh, yes. Well, thank you very much, and I'm deeply flattered. I started that book three times, and I wanted to write about my grandmothers and my mother's generations because I knew quite a lot about their, about the times that they had lived through, and together they had lived through pretty much the whole um, 20th century. So I wanted to have a character that would take us through those years, which were fascinating years. But neither my mother nor my grandmother was a fitting person to be that character because they were both too nice. And uh, they just, you know, it couldn't, it couldn't be them. So I started out with a female character who was, who was that age but dead. And she was being discovered through a living relative uh, via the proverbial hat box full of letters. Well, that didn't go on for long. Uh, so I had to throw out that and start again. And this time that character was alive and she was being discovered by two other characters, a male one and a female one who were not married to each other. And the container had gotten bigger. It was now a suitcase and it had a photograph album in it. Well, the male character and the female character, he was married to somebody else. He just had twins. Um, those two people started having an affair and they took over the book. So I had to put them in a drawer. They remain in that drawer to this very day. And then that character, the third time of starting, the character began speaking for herself. And that is the Iris who is in the book today. And once she started talking for herself, then the book really moved along and the container got even bigger. It became a steamer trunk and it is in the novel to this very day in the chapter called The Steamer Trunk, which is, <laughs> which is why you know that I'm telling you the truth. So that's how it came about. And a lot of, I don't have a technique. I, it's more or less like playing with mud. You know, you make it into a shape. It's not the shape you want. You destroy that. You try another one. And, you just keep going that way until you have something that, that, catch, that pleases you. Maybe one or two more, two more. Hello, Ms. Atwood. Um, I'm assuming you have time to read sometimes, so I was wondering if you could tell us what the last three books you read were. What the last three books I read were. Boy, that's a hard one. Um, because I've been on this tour since August the 30th. And um, 
I haven't actually had a lot of time to read. I mostly read magazines when I'm on these tours. I can tell you that my magazines of choice, if that's any help. <laughs> I just picked up a, a Harper's and a New Yorker. But before that, the last time I got on a plane, I had a Wired, a Discover, uh, and a Scientific American and a National Geo. But I've now read all those issues, so I didn't get those this time. Um, what was the last full book that I read? I know that I enjoyed it quite well. And I actually, I can rem tell you what it was. It was a book called The Golden Mean. And it's by an author called Annabelle Lyon. And it is about um, Aristotle, who was the teacher of Alexander the Great. So it's about his life while he's teaching Alexander the Great, a potential killer if there ever was one. Uh, and then I, right before that, I read a book by Hilary Mantel before she won the Booker called Wolf Hall. And Wolf Hall is set at the time of Henry VIII, an all-time favorite. Uh, we just can't get enough of Henry VIII, it seems. Uh, Phil, Philippa Gregory writing about the Boleyn girls. She's been deeply into Henry VIII as well. But Hilary Mantel's book is from the point of view of Thomas Cromwell, a character who usually gets the fuzzy end of the lollipop from people who write about Henry VIII. It's usually Thomas More who's the hero, and Thomas Cromwell is this nasty Machiavellian uh, sneak. And this one, however, takes the Thomas Cromwell figure and follows him through. And a good couple of sidebar books to read in connection with that are, are, are Machiavelli's The Prince and the Courtier, because that's the kind of thing that, that was going on at these Renaissance courts. Um, I was about to say it's kind of like Har the Harvard English Department in 1961, but I'm not going to say that. Anyway, it's really good, and I've liked her work for many, many years. Uh, her, so that, those are the last two that I can remember. How's that? I think so. they were both quite long. Right now I'm reading a book called The Square Persimmon, which is by my Japanese publisher, and it is, who is also a writer, and it's a collection of short stories, and I've just gotten into that, and it's pretty interesting, too. But it's a lot shorter. So it fitted into my carry-on, <laughs> whereas the other ones never would have done. So um, I was told that you are vehemently not of the opinion that you are a science fiction writer. That I'm not a what? A science fiction writer? That I'm not, oh, well, okay. Let's do the science it. fiction question. What this is about is fair labeling on packages. When something says bran flakes on the outside, I want there to actually be bran flakes inside it. Uh, so I don't wish to deceive people by leading them to believe that they're going to get Planet X uh, when they are not going to get that. So we can do the genealogy. We can put, OK, general heading. We could call it maybe books that are not realistic fiction, detective stories, mysteries, bodice rippers, thrillers, uh, westerns, uh, nurse novels, um, horror, terror, uh, weird tales of um, sort of ghosts and vampires, werewolves, those things. OK, everything that isn't that, what's left? Well, what's left is a line of books that descended from two ancestral strains. One of them was Jules Verne, who wrote in the 19th century things like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and Around the World in a Balloon. And he wrote, he wrote about things that might conceivably happen you know, that we might, that were already foreseen in the technology of their day, and he was pushing it a bit further to see what it would be like to actually go that far under the sea, etc. cetera. Um, Captain Nemo, I always liked him. Um, and the second line descends through H.G. Wells, who really cracked that envelope with a book called The War of the Worlds. 
uh, and a previous book of his called The Island of Dr. Moreau, which you can find in the bookstore with an introduction written by no other than myself. Uh, because once upon a time, when I was living in Cambridge and I was working on my doctorate, which I never finished because I went off to write film scripts instead, I was working in this area. I was writing on a subject called the English Metaphysical Romance, which started with George MacDonald and descends through the line of uh, Ryder Haggard and uh, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, and nobody else was interested in doing that at the time, so just think of it as a sort of weird prophetic thing. And um, in my researches, I kept looking for the equivalent of that kind of thing in America, which didn't exist then, but it does now, but it's another whole story. Okay, H.G. Wells, the fantasy element. Uh, War of the Worlds, um, large talking squid arrive in glowing tin cans shot from Mars and come out and proceed to drink your blood through straws. Now, this is not going to happen anytime soon. And it was not going to happen any time then, either. <laughs> it's completely a fictional element, which is nonetheless interesting because it shows how people might react to that sort of thing, and I always loved it when I was 12. So Jules Verne, on the other hand, was horrified by this kind of invention of H.G. Wells. He, say, he said, mais il en vente, but he invents. <laughs> But all of the golden age sci-fi really has as its ancestor those early, quite brilliant stories of, of H.G. Wells. Well, there's two ancestral strains. The Jules Verne one morphed into, there was a kind of a mix over in a novel called We by, by Zem Yatin, uh, which a Russian writer writing in the early days of the uh, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, they didn't allow him to publish it there and no wonder because it had the original Big Brother in it. And that then split off and became Brave New World and 1984 it divided in two, the two strains. And both of those books are things that happen on our planet that we could conceivably do. Uh, the technology was being thought about and to some extent has even kind of, some of it has even sort of happened. Um, it's not on Planet X. On, I love those books, I just can't write them. Um, I saw lots of Star Trek, I can go like this. Um, and Star Wars, I took my mother, she said, well that was a piece of fluff, and I said, well I didn't notice you going to sleep. <laughs> took my mother because I knew there wasn't any SEX in it. Um, so it's just a matter of getting it straight. And I think it's, it's good to know the DNA of books and the DNA of the kinds of books that I write descends through the Jules Verne, uh, Brave New World, Ridley Walker, uh, John Wyndham, Death of Grass, uh, though not um, some of his other books, not Day of the Triffids. Um, haven't invented that yet, might maybe, but haven't done it. Death of Grass, on the other hand, really quite possible. So there you have it. Don't have anything against it. Read lots of it as a child. Want to hear the whole plot of the one where they, <laughs> where they discovered a planet full of beautiful women who uh, like to feed up the men who wander into their grasp and show them a good time. But what they're really aiming for is the day when they let them all out of the holding pen, chase them down, bite them in the neck, and lay eggs on them like spiders. I'm quite good at remembering plots. <laughs> so is there anything you want to know about that particular subject, about which I could go on at some length? I'm doing the um, Elman Lectures in 2010, and the general title is called Imagining Other Worlds and I will deal with it at even more length with footnotes, and then I hope we will never ever hear another word about it. And as for the idea that I'm, I'm uh, snotty about science fiction, it's entirely false. I just can't write it. Uh, I can't write the planet X kind. I would love to be able to. Uh, the Blind Assassin has somebody in it who can write that kind in the 30s when there were lizard men uh, allowed. 
So I also can't write the ones with dragons in them, although I'll go anywhere for a good dragon. Best dragons are Ursula Le Guin's dragons in the Earthsea trilogy. Nobody has ever done better dragons than those. So that, I think, is, was the last question. And thank you so much for being a great audience. And I hope you will all now take the following pledge. Would you put your hands on your heart, please? <laughs> I promise never to drink anything but shea-grown organic coffee because the other kind is a big killer of migratory songbirds. Thank you. Yes. Hands in the air. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you.